Okay. There we go. All right, awesome. So Maggie told you a little bit about her. Um, this is a really old picture of me. Um, so <laughs> this is actually like my second day with extension, like almost four years ago now. So a um, little bit about me. Um, I've already told you my title and where I cover, so I don't need to tell you that, but um, I was raised in Lake County, Illinois. So I think I saw somebody online from Galena, that's Northwest Illinois. I'm from the farthest Northeast Illinois you can go. Um, about 30 minutes west of the lake, literally a baseball throw from the Wisconsin border, um, pretty small town, Antioch, Illinois, if anybody's ever heard of it. Fox Lake is nearby, lots of boating and recreation and hunting and stuff. But my parents started taking us across the border and buying pasture-raised beef and farm fresh eggs when I was like nine, right when we moved up there. And it would be like on a summer day when the rest of my friends wanted to play. And I was like, my dad was a stay-at-home dad for a little bit. And I was like, why are we here? What, what, why are we not like playing street hockey or whatever? But those experiences grew on me. And um, even when he did get a job, he ended up being a teacher and cooking a lot of uh, uh, farm, farm focused ingredient meals, uh, fresh meals. We're really lucky. We had a lot of people come over to our house for dinner. Um, and that, that definitely stuck with me into adulthood. So um, got interested in um, small farms production. Um, I did a master's program at U of I in the crop science department. And um, most people, when they think of crop science at U of I, rightly so, um, are thinking about corn, soybeans, um, et cetera. But we, I was in the like offshoot kind of weird group of people in crop science that actually studied like direct consumption food for people. Um, so I did a lot of work with agroforestry crops as well as um, vegetable weed control practices. So um, it was a really cool program. Um, and then before joining Extension in uh, January 2021, um, I apprenticed on a, a small um, farmer's market and CSA style vegetable farm in Sandy, Oregon. Um, so if anybody's ever been to Mount Hood from Portland, it's about 45 minutes east of Portland. It's like 16,000 people with a spread out over a big area. So small kind of mountainous town. Um, and let's see if I can do this advancing of slides again. Um, this is a picture um, of what I was doing in 2020. So this was about the best possible place I could have been uh, in pandemic times, not to rub it in or anything, but um, while everybody else was stuck inside, I was on top of a little like hilltop learning how to grow carrots and whatnot. So it was super hard though, most physically and emotionally and socially like hardest thing I've ever done because it was super isolating. We were like at the you know back end of a town, like way up on a ridge, like kind of in the boonies. So like I became part of this farmer's farm family's pod and that we were, we were it, you know, there were like 10 of us, little tiny community grown vegetables and providing food for the community, but kind of isolating and you don't know what's going to happen to your friends and family, et cetera. But um, slept, breathed, ate, et cetera, the vegetable production, wash pack, sale, lifestyle. Um, when I wasn't doing that, I was hiking and spending time with friends and family. And one of the biggest, uh, Couple of less, some of the biggest couple of lessons that I learned um, at Slice of Heaven are these three things right here. Um, soils and plants 110% do communicate their needs um, if you know what you're looking for, or if you can train your eyes to know what you're looking for. Um, the soils that you manage and steward will give back to you um, in proportion to their treatment. And the last one is probably the most important one. Um, I was doing like 55, 60 hour weeks, but of like vegetable labor and anywhere we possibly could, if there was like a smarter, non-invasive way to do it and to like save on the back muscles, um, working smarter, not harder. It's a really overdone phrase, but it's super, super applicable to vegetable farming, um, but also just homesteading, farmsteading, growing food, cooking, existing, honestly. Um, so more on that point here. Um, who here uses compost? Okay, like the majority of people in this room and uh, people on the chat, if you want to throw in like a thumbs up or whatever for whether or not you use compost, that'd be great to check later. But I'm betting it's the majority of you. And if not, it's a really cool resource. It's very ubiquitous in vegetable production. I definitely recommend it for small fruits production. And I would even recommend it for adding on like new nut and fruit trees. Um, but uh, probably the most common denominator for uh, compost is it's really heavy, uh, especially when it gets wet, which just seems to be like right before you apply it, like almost every time, um, no matter what I do. 
But so how do you all apply your compost? Field bar on a shovel. Yeah, right. <laughs> Low tech, right? Yeah. That's so um in like in big production systems, I've seen um, manure spreaders adapted to be used in compost systems. There's a business in uh, southeast, no, southwest Wisconsin called Cosmo. Um, they're a big time uh, compost production company there. There's another one closer to, to here called uh, Better Earth and it's near Peoria. Um, they both have like super huge fields where they turn the compost and they have big compost spreaders. But for most of us in small beds, small production, diversified uh, production of whatever it is you wanna grow, um, we're definitely doing it, like Paul said, the old shovel in the wheelbarrow route, right? And would you rather grow it in place if you could? Because I don't know about you, but that sucked <laughs> to spread all this compost. It smelled really good. It was a, like a good character building experience. <laughs> the farmer that I was working for told me that when I left the farm, I was going to be made of wood. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know if I was, I wasn't very interested in that, like the day that I got there when I left. It was a funny joke, but anyway, so we're talking today about basically how to grow compost in place using cover crops. Um, I'd say I've cut down my compost application about 75%, not 100%. I definitely still use it in conjunction with seeding specifically of compost or facilitating the cover crop breakdown. Um, so we'll get into that momentarily, but um, and I'm going to tell this story with some pictures. Um, so in January of 2021, I inherited the Unity Community Garden uh, parcel, which interestingly uh, is the flyer and the location for our next class. Um, so I inherited this uh, production garden. It's in Northwest Normal on Orlando Ave, and it's about uh, 2,400 square feet. It's about 40 wide by like 60 long. And um, it had been used as like a, a parcel community garden before not like a, we produce food for food insecurity uh, needs like we do now. Um, but during 2020, it hadn't been cropped because of the pandemic. So people in the office here went to work remote. It didn't get cropped. There were a ton of weeds. There was a ton of ponding. Um, so some flooded, um, definitely like subprime uh, areas of the garden. And it definitely looked uh, like it was time for a reset. So this is a picture of the garden after I had it professionally tilled. Um, we did have a rear time Husqvarna tiller, but it needed like it needed more than even than even that could do. Weeds were like yay tall, and I just wasn't prepared for that. So this is as good as it gets in terms of a blank slate. Um, this is uh, when you definitely want to cover crop. There's no weed competition. There's not too much that you could see. Um, this was easy, effective, and I want to stress the last part a lot because like homesteading activities and farmsteading, et cetera, is broadly speaking, a lot of work, no matter how you slice it. So anytime you can have fun and like experiment and be interested and creative, I jump at that whenever I can. So um, it was super cool. So this right here is a photo of what the cover crop looked like that I decided to see in about mid-March. Um, I used a combination that I have here today in bags um, available for purchase after the class if you're interested. Um, oats and field peas. Uh, actually, what I've got is uh, Austrian winter peas, which will grow a little bit later into the season. Um, but so yeah, oats, field peas, and then red and white clover. Um, I landed on this uh, from uh, this one resource called um, Growing, let's see, Growing or Managing Cover Crops Profitably. I can't remember the exact title, but it's from SAIR, uh, Sustainable Agriculture Research. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the the acronym, but SARE is a really good uh, or nonprofit organizational resource for anybody growing small acreage, anything. Um, SARE, like S A R E. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Yep. So uh, this is these are field pea or these are oats that are actually about to set seed here. So um, this was spring or end of spring into June 2021. This right here is uh, that I'm holding upside down is a gigantic cow pea. Um, I've got some cowpea and uh, Japanese millet going in my garden right now in a spot that I chose not to grow anything in for summer. This was my um, landed upon uh, decision for summer cover cropping. Um, I'll get into like how I chose the species and why, et cetera, in a little bit. Um, so this is mid-July. Um, what I did prior to uh, seeding this is uh, we chopped down um, our spring cover crop 
mulched it really fine. And then I literally broadcast summer cover crop seeds on top of like a bunch of biomass and everything. And every book I ever read told me that like that was not the way to do it. And, it, <laughs> and you needed to no-till drill your seed. You need really good seed to soil contact, which you do. That last part is, is true, but I overseed it. So you'll see a seeding rate on anything you buy or anything you look up that'll say three pounds per thousand square feet. Um, in this situation, I just doubled it because I found a really cheap vendor of cover crop seed and just was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Let's find out. <laughs> and now today, thanks to that experimentation, I know a little bit more what I'm doing. So this is Japanese millet down here in the bottom left. That's a really nice summer cover crop option. Again, cowpea. Um, cowpea is a legume. Uh, like we talked about just at the beginning with the nitrogen fixation comment and Japanese millet is a grass. Um, note in the slide before that the same combo is also present. Field tea is a legume and then oats is a grass. So we'll come back to that. And uh, yeah, be writing down your questions that you want to uh, discuss and like grill me about at the end here. So um, this is just another shot of our cowpea Japanese millet combo. You could see some asparagus that didn't want to die in the background, just ignore that. Um, and you could also see some weeds are emerging. Um, it's not a perfect system, especially when you're starting basically from zero, which is where I was starting from. Um, I waited before that spring cover crop went in. Um, I had it tilled, but I hadn't had my ducks in a row and I didn't have my spring cover crop seed. So the ground had about 10 days to settle after it was professionally tilled. And when I got out there the day after it was tilled, it was like powder. You don't want to like, you don't want to do that. You don't want to get there with the rototiller. You want to stop and be able to have some soil aggregation. Your soil particles should be like marble sized, like small marble sized or gravel sized, but not powder. Anyway, all that powder settled and it was like concrete when I seeded my spring cover crop. But again, thanks to the power of overseeding, it totally worked. So yeah, um, moving on here. So here's a picture of exactly what happened between the summer cover crop and the fall cover crop. We're going to go through the exact steps in the process in a couple of slides, like from thought about what to do all the way to a second cover crop. So just bear with me for one minute. Um, so this is a picture of the summer cover crop being terminated. Um, does anybody have like a high powered string trimmer at home? Yeah, or like a really nice mower? How about a T post and a rope? <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so we'll get into like tactics for termination as well. People are people get like scared about what happens if it doesn't die. It'll, like I promise you, it'll, it'll die. Just mow it. Or anyway, we knocked it down with a string trimmer, just laying it down. We actually had a blade attachment. Um, you can buy any of these at Lowe's. If you have a string trimmer at home, you can probably buy a three prong blade attachment at any big box um, hardware store, um, prop or like Lowe's, Ace Hardware, Home Depot, whatever. Um, and then that'll allow you to cut through some more serious biomass than just your typical yard grass. So we laid it down and then we actually raked it to the sides of the landscape that you see. So to the north and south edges and then the east and west edges. Um, it's important to point out that when I started with the Unity Garden, I divided the parcel in two. Um, and one half of the garden we grew our vegetables on. The other half of the garden we cover cropped in spring, fall and winter for like a total rejuvenation for 50% of that ground. So that's what's being pictured here. Um, so once we raked our cover crop residue from the summer one all to the sides of the parcel, then we spread this seed mix onto it, which is, uh, I believe this is the Johnny Selected Seed um, Fall uh, Green Manure Mix. You can go and look that up on your phone or laptop at home. Um, Johnny's is expensive, but their seed quality is really good. Um, I've since migrated away from using Johnny's selected seed for cover crops for the most part. And now I use a farm called, or a, a business called Stock Seed Farms. Stock Seed Farms is out of Murdoch, Nebraska. And they have seed available by the pound, like dollar ten a pound instead of way more than that for Johnny's. But if you're doing a small parcel and you wanna have a nice mix and you wanna have a germ test and everything, Johnny's is all right. Anyway, um, so to recap, Cut down our summer cover crop, scraped it to the side. Why am I scraping it to the side? I used the term earlier in the presentation, might not remember. Seed to soil contact. So if my cover crop seed is sitting on a bed of biomass and there's like three inches of stuff between the seed and the ground, when that little first root comes out, it's going to have to work really hard to find the soil. But 
if the cover crop seed is sitting on like a quarter of an inch of residue, it's going to find the soil sooner or later as long as we keep it watered. So we scraped the residue off, we seeded this fall mix, then in the next picture here, we raked the residue back on from the summer residue. So now we have on bare soil, now we have winter cover crop seed, summer cover crop residue, and then even though I said I, I didn't eliminate my compost, right, I cut it down. Um, this is about a half inch, maybe three quarter inch of compost over the whole thing. Um, this is no longer necessary at Unity Garden now, but again, because this is the reset year, it was necessary. Um, so does that make sense? We're kind of like lasagna bedding our cover crop seed so that it has some stuff weighing down on it and pressing it down into the soil. So um, as far as the results go, that left half of the garden that I just showed you a picture of, again, it's only 50% of our 2,400 square feet. So now we're talking 1,200 square foot of area, but about one third of that is, is um, walking alleys. So about 800 square feet of production let, let us have about 2,000 pounds of food the following year in that half of the garden. Um, I don't have any data from prior to when I joined Extension, so I can't tell you how much of an increase that was, but um, in 2024 now, this year, we're back on, because of our flip-flopping yearly schedule, we're now back on that side of the garden this year, and the jury's still out on how much we'll produce. Um, but uh, we've got tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, okra, winter squash, and all that other thing all that other stuff that you see on the list. Um, I think we're gonna break probably 2,200 pounds. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, I've attributed our success out there to at least in, in certain part to cover crops being a permanent fixture of our crop rotation plan and just making as much bandwidth and space and time for them as humanly possible. Um, it's also really cool for a bunch of other reasons. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, quick question. What's your time frame? Start your season. Yeah, um, I will definitely get to that. That's okay. that's going to be covered here. So the question was, um, uh, yeah, write that one down so we can discuss it. The question was timing of summer versus spring versus fall cover crop seed. 100% going to walk you through the fall one, and then you can ask me again about the summer one. Um, so that's just my story of like how I got into cover cropping. I'm going to go really quickly through some additional benefits for like why I think you should try and get them onto your landscape as soon as possible, and then we'll take that quick break that I mentioned and return for how do I build a bed with cover crops. So again, just really majestic picture of oats right here. Like I really like how they look, really like how they smell. Um, once you grow, it's like a tomato. Once you grow like a field full of field peas, it's gonna be really hard to not do that again. It's really fun. So here's some additional benefits that you should consider. Um, organic matter production is as close as possible to that compost slide that I shared. Um, there's, there's like, this is, a, this is kind of giving away one of my coming slides, but there's a misconception that um, some of these cover crops get like really woody, really stemmy. Some of them can, depending on the species, but that they won't break down. Um, if you bury them with any compost at all, that is nonsense. <laughs> the earthworms find that like thin layer of compost as like a nice refuge. And they'll come up from the ground and be like, people left me all this food to eat. This is awesome. And then you come back and I can stick my finger down on my knuckle in the soil right now, four years later, and at the beginning, seriously, it was like concrete. And I didn't do hardly any of that. So um, organic matter builds up with cover crop use, even if you crop it. So if you cover crop it and then grow tomatoes or whatever, um, it still builds up as long as you're not tilling like three times a year. If you do, you'll burn up that organic matter. That's a, ton that's a topic for a different workshop. Um, weed suppression is a huge one. So that cow pea and Japanese millet stand that I showed you, there was that one little problematic patch of foxtail, but other than that, there wasn't really any weed competition. Um, how much time do you guys spend weeding your gardens every year? Too much. A lot? Oh, too much? Yeah. Too much? Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, we, we don't really spend hardly any time at Unity Garden weeding anymore. Um, we weed one time when we plant our transplants, and then we put landscape fabric down in the walkways. Um, and all of the, we have about like a six inch strip of open ground where we put our row of cucumbers, row of tomatoes, et cetera. But in that six inch strip, we probably have like two inches of old rotting um, biomass from cover crops. And that prevents, I'd say probably 70 to 80% of our weeds. And we'll hand weed one time uh, right after we transplant. And then we'll put some compost down or some mulch down or something 
And that's pretty much it. Um, we have a bindweed problem at the garden, but that's my bad because I put straw that had bindweed all over the garden one year. So we have bindweed like underneath everything if you look, but that's because of something I added to the garden. So compaction alleviation, who's got some beds that are just like kind of hard? Anybody have those? You like stick your finger in the soil or like things are stunted, maybe not performing as well as they used to. So um, daikon radish is a really good cover crop for busting up compaction. So is cereal rye, which I have available today as well. Um, I'll tell you about like where and when to use what, but there's a lot of different cover crop options for breaking up hard ground and then making it um, available to have plants develop roots that can actually break into that ground the next time. Okay. Um, uh, I've heard it. So there's a couple different ones. Um, Stockseed Farm sells something called oilseed radish. That's not an edible variety. You can eat it, but it doesn't taste good. Um, there's a brand of radish from, I think it's high mowing seed, if I'm not mistaken, called specifically called tillage radish. Um, I've seen one called groundhog, like a variety of daikon radish called groundhog. You just want to search for a, a daikon radish seed or a tillage radish seed that's specifically been bred to get really long. Because you'll see like the top half popping out of the ground, but you won't see like the 18 inches of tap root underneath that. Carrots actually surprisingly um, break up ground pretty well too. Um, really badly compacted ground, they'll be really like stumpy. But in my ground, which is pretty hard, but not the worst ever, um, they, they're still getting like 12, 16 inches long, which is awesome. So yeah, um, almost free nitrogen fertilizer. So uh, Paul earlier alluded to the fact that He's growing beans for nitrogen. Um, is anybody else familiar with that like reciprocal um, process of nitrogen fixation from cover crops? Okay, sort of, kind of. Awesome. So we'll cover that um, in one slide from now, I think. Um, long story short, legumes like field pea or like our cow pea um, have an ability to take atmospheric nitrogen in the air that we breathe, otherwise unavailable to plants and to crops for fertilization and suck that down into the plant and store it in the roots of specifically legume species of cover crops. And then have that, um, once, you till, once you kill that plant through various means, it then becomes available to um, our uh, calf crops over time in a slow release form, uh, format. Uh, erosion prevention, last four, pretty quick erosion prevention. So like, does anybody grow on a sort of slope or hillside or anything like that? Not really a good idea, right? Because if it rains a ton and there's nothing growing and you see your soil kind of start to gully or wash away, there's cracks in the ground that form. Even on flat ground though, um, even when there's nothing growing, like look at any pond or stream or runoff space after like a three inch rain, even here in McLean County where most of the ground is flat and you'll see the water is super murky with soil runoff. In those big mega rain events that are getting more common, if you have a cover crop stand growing, um, even underneath some cash crops. Um, they do a really good job of having like a fibrous root system that'll retain a lot of um, soil and a lot of nutrients so that you don't lose them. Same thing with nutrient scavenging. Um, a lot of times as we till our soil, we force our nutrients down into the soil. Or uh, yeah, I might've knocked my, my, uh, my uh, USB here. Hopefully I can continue the presentation. But a lot of the times our nutrients end up lower in the soil profile than our crops can use them. Um, cover crops will send down roots, locate those, bring them up into their bodies, and then when you kill them and lay them down on top of the soil surface, they're available to the plants over time. Um, mental health. So last year we bought our first house and the backyard was just grass, nothing else. I hate mowing my lawn. Waste of time, waste of money. Like my my kid will be, you know, running around next year and we preserve some grass for her, but slowly but surely I'm winning my war of uh, destroying the grass one bed at a time. Uh, my wife wants to preserve some of it, but we'll see. Um, but uh, establishing cover crop beds, especially of cereal rye and winter rye, allowed me to grow something that was like chest high vegetation by the time that it got really cold. And then all through winter, I got to look at this awesome tall dead grass where there was literally nothing else to look at. And I get the winter blues kind of bad, we go somewhere warm, usually once every winter if we can. Um, just having something just to look at is a blessing. Um, and then bonus points if it attracts birds, which the winter wheat did. Um, sunflowers are really good for that too. So, and then ecosystem service and habitat kind of just gave that one away. 
Um, sunflowers are my personal favorite for ecosystem uh, habitat and a cover crop at the same time. So right now I've got a bunch of sunflowers that are as tall as me. And I've never had goldfinches in my backyard before, but we have a ton of goldfinches now that are just going to town on my sunflowers. And uh, they're drought resistant. They break up the ground really nice. Um, and they're a nice uh, option for like cover crops people think are a waste of time in the summer, especially when you could be growing something edible. And to a certain extent, there's something to that. But like uh, Maggie said, a lot of people grow flowers. And so that's like a really good multi-use option. So winding down here, we'll go through misconceptions and then drawbacks, and then we'll take a break. So I'm not going to go through every misconception on this list. Um, I think everybody has them. I had them too when I started. Like I mentioned, like nothing about how I broadcast those seed on top of a bunch of biomass was supposed to work, air quotes, according to the books. But residue won't decompose, um, decreased water availability. Some of these are more relevant to the commercial ag space. So a lot of corn and soybean farmers do actually get dinged if there's like a performance risk to the following corn or soybean. So there is actually like a built in kind of resistance to cover cropping in the current um, uh, liability, or not liability, crop insurance model. That is changing though. There's a lot of federal and especially a lot of state programs that uh, are available state by state for cover cropping. So the tide is starting to change um, at the commercial large scale farms uh, uh, network, but slowly. Um, I just wanna point out the bottom one though, that cover crops are the silver bullet. Um, I am pro cover crop, I'm team cover crop, but they're definitely not the silver bullet. So you may experiment with it one time and it might definitely not do what you want it to the first time, either because weather doesn't work in your favor, the seed that you bought is poor, you thought you had water access at that site, but you don't now. And so your stand isn't like really thick. So just give it a couple of tries. Um, but yeah, uh, try other things if that first one doesn't work. And then finally, some potential drawbacks to cover cropping. So um, I always try and acknowledge these. Um, again, we don't need to run through them all. No, maybe we'll run through them all. Um, cost, so here's, here's what I'm saying. Um, it costs money for seed, it costs your time, and it costs your labor to make this happen at any scale. It could be like a three foot by 20 foot, like a little bed, and that still costs some amount of something to make happen. But like I was saying at the beginning, you can add a ton of compost and pay for all that and like it'd be a really big deal. Or you can walk through your garden and just kind of sprinkle some seed and walk, walk away and turn your sprinkler down. So you're having to pay money in both situations, but one of them in my mind is way more enjoyable. Um, but I just want to like emphasize it's, it's not a zero uh, dollar entry in game. Um, there are some termination issues if you, if you seed cover crops in spring um that won't winter kill because it's springtime um and if you don't kill them they can set seed and they can become their own weed problem um but that's why we have these little classes to educate people about exactly how to terminate cover crops um weed issues if your stand of cover crops is poor especially with something like cereal rye over winter when a bunch of like little weeds like to grow over winter when there's no cash crop growing that can be a problem um, so I always over overseed. So like, again, three pounds per thousand square feet. I read that as 4.5 pounds per 500 square feet or whatever it might be. And we'll get to that. And then finally, um, nutrient issues, residue management issues. There are some cover crops that generate so much biomass that it's a problem or it can be a problem if you don't manage it for the next crop or it can gum up your tiller or whatever it may be. But what I'm going to... Uh, demo, field pea, and oats, that doesn't happen. All right, so these are the seven steps that we're going to run through when we come back from our break. But And I've shown you pictures of most of them, but I just wanted to like get this list out in front of you and in front of the people um, on Zoom. Um, we start with planning and preparation. So right now, today, you might be really stoked to try this, or you might, might still need some selling. So that's what the second half of the presentation is for. But you start thinking about what to do now, um, and then you end up buying your seed, um, inoculating your seed if that's going to be required, seeding your seed, um, maturation and termination dates. So you see that it's starting to grow, and you need to start making what I call your exit strategy. Um, and then we see flowering or seed set. That's termination time. There's the actual act of terminating your cover crop. And then finally, residue management and breakdown as we go to our cash crop or the next cover. So 
those on Zoom, thanks for your attention. I see a bunch more uh, chat comments uh, than when I started, so I'm going to check that out momentarily. Oops. We are going to take a five-minute break um, because I know that was a ton of info, and I want people to be able to absorb it, break down some questions, because as soon as we're done with the final part of the presentation here, we have a ton more time uh, than was originally listed. This is supposed to go to 7.30. It's not even 6.30 yet. Um, I'm only going to take like probably 15 or 20, probably 15 minutes at the most to finish the second half. So let's have a conversation about like qualms, questions, concerns, segment, whatever. Um, but yeah, it is, my watch is a little fast. What time is it? It is 6.25, 6.24. So right about uh, 6.30, we'll come back and uh, dive into how to make cover crop beds now for spring production next year. It's like cucumber beetles, make sure you know the pros and cons of what you're planting. So if you have cucumbers, I guess there's an issue with sunflowers. Um, I guess our cucumber plants, our cucumber plants died from wind like before I could see that. So I guess I don't know. Um, but that's a nice comment. Thanks for sharing. And a uh, question here, can you plant cover crops over a septic system and then do vegetable gardening? That's a great question. Wow. Um, probably don't want to be growing something directly over a septic system, but I think those have to be pretty far in the ground. And I mean, vegetable roots don't go that deep, but cover crop roots can go pretty deep. So um, great questions. We'll definitely get into some more conversation when we're done with this presentation. Um, I don't see anybody saying there's any issue with the audio, and I've been talking for like three minutes, so I'm presuming everything's still good there. We'll uh, get going with the rest of the talk. That's awesome that some people in here have tested cover crops before or or are about to. Super exciting. So um, there's two, there's one mix, and then there's one monoculture um, of cover crops that I always recommend to people just starting out. Um, and one of those has already been alluded to in the chat, and that's oats and field pea mix. Um, in bags, again, um, available for 10 bucks, cash or check on your way out. I was thinking about making this like a paid registration and we've done that before for like materials and supplies needed for classes, but I decided to do just free registration, distribute the info. And then if you guys have any interest, we have seed available for purchase. Um, I don't have field pea, otherwise known as forage pea in here. I'm using uh, one that I've actually never used. So you guys can be my guinea pigs and they're called, it's very related though. It's an Austrian winter pea. And um, I did some research on it. It's not like I didn't look it up or how it performs or whatnot, but I haven't used it personally. The only difference supposedly between that and forage pea is that it's already down to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it'll grow longer into the season and it may be a little more winter hardy until like maybe last year, we didn't have our first hard, hard freeze until like December 10th or something crazy like that. So um, that could add to that mental health landscape effect maybe later later on, but so oats and field peas is what I'll broadly be speaking on. And then I'll mention cereal rye and how that works. This is a picture of our, my fir very first oat and field pea combo. So Maggie had on um, her very first picture of her first 12 dozen eggs. This is my uh, comparison to that photo. So it's super, it was super awesome to see, uh, even though it was not, not that big a deal to most folks. Um, so here's just another orientation view of it. This is a field pea in flower. Um, always check your slides. Earlier today, I had the titles flipped. So it said oats and it said field pea over here. Um, but yeah, so field pea in flower, that's termination time right there. You want 50 to 75% of your whatever it is. Um, if it's forming at, at the seed head formation stage or the flowering stage, that's when you terminate it. That's when it's reached its best potential for root growth down biomass production above and nodulation. Um, that's a fancy word for nitrogen fixation um, on the roots. This is oats. Um, they're, if you look closely or you know what oats look like when they're mostly formed, um, that's about what they look like when they're ready almost uh, to terminate. If you squeeze any of them at this stage, that's called the milky stage because they exude oat milk, like what you buy at the store. But oat milk at the store is one part true oat milk, one part water, one part preservative, and some other nonsense. So I don't know if I buy that or not, but I have it sometimes in like a latte. So real quick, yeah, you're sure. saying your blend here, you have to terminate it. It doesn't just get killed off by the winter. Yeah. So when I first used this, because I started in January, and so I first cover crop in March, I did have to terminate one of several ways that I'll tell you. But if we do this now, 
at winter, this next winter kills. So okay. you asked a question earlier about termination and raised beds. This is the mix to plant for you um, because it will it will die from 32 degrees, sometimes 28, sometimes 30. Um, but yeah, as soon as we have a couple of hard freezes, if you plant it ASAP, you're gonna get the most biomass accumulation, the most nitrogen growth if you buy an inoculant to seed with your cover crop seed. Um, and then uh, um, and then it'll die, it'll just lay down. It'll look like somebody herbicided it. If you know what that looks like in the field, you have a field full of weeds and then they turn brown and fall over, except it's just from the natural process of cold. So that's um, why I pitch it as a super beginner cover crop for now. But yes, I did have to terminate it in the spring. Okay. And, and we will talk about methods to do so. Um, so again, going down through that list of seven parts of the process in your mind, this is number one. Or actually, actually, it's, yeah, number one's on the left, number two's on the right. So um, we have our ideas phase. How do I choose a cover crop species? This was me in February of 2021. Should I mix species? I don't know. I've never done this before. Um, I just, we just grew vegetables. Interestingly, at the very end of my time in Oregon, in like the last possible month that he could have done it, my, uh, my farmer mentor used a cone spreader and just like way laid on it crap to, of uh, oats and field peas. And that's kind of where I got the idea to start. Um, and, and then disked it in. So added some seed soil contact. So get the wheel spinning a little bit. We have our idea. Um, should I mix species? And the answer to that question that I have for you is another question, which is, do you like to eat the same thing every day? <laughs> Would you like that? No, probably not, right? So soil microbes um, are the same way. So there's some soil microbes that like to eat the root exudate, the plant juice that comes off of the roots of one species, and then another, and then another. And there's fungi that connect plants that like a diversity of diet as well. So in my book, the more species we can throw down, the more soil microbes we can get working for us quicker, right? So um, soil microbes like diet variation. So I went with a two-way mix to start things out. Um, this is the seeding stage. So again, we're at Unity Garden. Um, I had the bright idea of using a salt spreader that I found in the shed. Um, it was what I had at the time, and I didn't believe that um, hand spreading of cover crop seed uh, would be like the best approach. I've actually <laughs> since put this back in the shed, and I do just broadcast seed by hand at this site, but it's all a question of your scale. So if you have like two acres, this is probably not going to be the way you want to go. You're probably going to want to get like a cone spreader, a small one for the back of an ATV, and then just do like an S curve, right? But because I'm only doing 2,400 square feet, I can hand broadcast pretty effectively, um, especially thanks to the fact that I'm overseeding, so I have a surplus of seed. Sometimes you get a little heavy handed and you get halfway through the plot and you're like, and I, you run out of seed before and then you got to buy more like really quick. So um, I did that one time, haven't, hasn't happened again. So add like a thin layer and then if, if you have excess and walk back over if you're going to do it that way. But so um, just a question of tools and scale. So this is our seeding stage. And then uh, just a quick note about legumes before we move on. Um, Paul alluded to this earlier. Um, when you're seeding a legume, um, the re one of the primary reasons is you're trying to capture nitrogen gas, N2, that's 79% of the air that we breathe, that is not available to the plants as fertilizer, and you're converting it into a plant-available fertilizer, broadly speaking, with the help of a beneficial bacteria. Um, on that website I mentioned, Stock Seed Farms, um, they sell um, inoculant. I'll show you a picture of it here in a second. For every species of legume, you just have to make sure and buy the correct one. And it's basically a black powder that you throw in a bucket with your cover crop seed. You can mix it with your bare hand. It doesn't hurt you. I wouldn't like get it in your face or your mouth or anything like that. But it's a beneficial bacteria. It's not going to make you sick. Um, again, don't eat it. But um, but you know. Uh, so you basically mix it around. You can use wetted seed, dry seed, doesn't seem to matter. Um, it's a couple of tablespoons to a couple of pounds of seed, so you don't need much at all. I think one bag of seed says it does 100 pounds. One bag of inoculant says it does 100 pounds of seed. I always I always use way more than I need because I'm just like, more and more, maybe I'll get more nitrogen. Never ran into any problems. Not best practice, but again, like I don't see any downside. Again, it does add an expense, but it ensures greater formation of nodules. What are nodules? Those are nodules right here. Um, so this is your next crop's fertilizer. These little red circles here on the screen are highlighting, this one's a little blurry, this one's less blurry, but 
It's crazy. They look like little microscopic kidney beans on the roof of your plants. So I ripped the cow pea out of the ground. I didn't even use a spade to dig it out. If I had, there probably would have been a bunch more roots attached to it, and I would have seen more nodules. But you know that they're nodules because if you find a big one and you cut it in half, it's red inside. And it's fixing heme iron, which is like basically part, it's a constituent of our blood. So the bacteria form a symbiotic relationship with the plant. Weird stuff happens. Long story short, it generates some amount of nitrogen for your future plant, future crops. Um, something like a field pea, um, agronomically speaking, um, if you've ever heard of like units of N in commercial ag speak, you want about 200 units of nitrogen for like a really good corn crop in this area of Illinois. Something like a field or forage pea is known to help you out about 50 or 60 units of N. Um, something like a red clover that you let go for a full year or an alfalfa that you go for a full year can do 100 plus pounds of N per acre. So you can get half of the way there for like commercial nutrient needs with these. Super cool. So here's uh, again some final notes on seeding with an inoculant. I already pretty much told you how to do it. Follow the label instructions. Check this out. It says peanut inoculant. And you're like, why do I want this? But if you read more finely, it also says treats cowpea. Lespedeza and mung bean. So this was for my cow pea summer cover crop. You don't want this one for pea and uh, and vetch. You want the pea vetch lentil inoculant for your field pea or Austrian winter pea or whatever. So again, stock seed farm. They're not the only one that sells this. Johnny Selected Seed sells inoculant as well. So wherever you're getting your seed, try and get some inoculant. Um, I had a question come up the other day. Um, can I grow um, legumes without the inoculant powder? The short answer is absolutely you can won't harm the plants at all. If you have done this before uh, in your same garden soil, you shouldn't hypothetically need to do this. This is more for like the big guns, resetting of the soil, for sure gonna add some nitrogen. If you're growing like a really heavy feeder crop next year, like a sweet corn or a tomato, um, I'd recommend doing the inoculant just to see what happens. I don't think you're gonna be disappointed, but no, you definitely don't need to do this every time. So something to play around with or think about. And then, all right, so here's our seed. Here's the emergence. And then this is what this uh, winter uh, Johnny's uh, fall green manure mix looked like about six weeks after planting. So it happens really fast. And I really enjoy being able to go check on something like that every day, especially if I'm doing it at my house and kind of watch the progress. Um, but a quick note on this, this establishment phase right here. Remember I said that little root is gonna emerge from the seed and then look for the soil. If it's on top of a big bed of biomass, that's going to be hard. But um, specifically what I want to reinforce here is do not let this dry out at this stage because all your work, like you're already, you're attending this class. You might be paying money for seed. You're going to spend time and effort putting the seed down. And then you see it emerge like this. Don't drop the ball on the five yard line and like leave town for three days and don't have like your neighbor's kid water it. And then you come home and it's dried out and you got to start over. It's like with it away. I've done it. It happens. Life happens, like Maggie said. So don't be too hard on yourself. If it does, just be prepared to go down to your local garden center and try and find some more oats or whatever it might be if this happens. Um, but yeah, again, um, this is this is not the maturation phase, but we're coming towards that right here on the right side of the screen. Once your cover crops start to look like this and they start to close canopy a little bit over the soil, you're pretty much in the clear with water. But until then, um, I, I water every two days when it's not raining, unless it's like 70 and like there's a heavy dew on everything all the time. If it's like a normal August, I'd be watering every 48 hours until you get to this point, which is when the cover crops are like four inches tall. And overseeding also helps with this. So you have like a really thick stand much quicker if you overseed than if you go by like the label rate of, for, of a cover crop seed. Um, three pounds per thousand square feet of oats and field people work, but it will close canopy slower, right? So, so this is the flowering stage. Again, we talked about this, 50 to 75% of your cover crop seed should be either flowering or forming a seed head for maximum benefit. And then this is our termination phase. I already showed you what, what this was. I think I told everybody what was going on here, but just for a very quick refresher, um, we had a summer cover crop we destroyed it, laid it down on the soil with a big um, blade weed whacker, scraped it off, put our fall cover crop down once ex uh, soil was exposed, then put the biomass back on with the rake and then buried it with compost. 
So this is actually several stages of the process in one photo, which I thought was really cool. Um, again, I know weed whackers are a great exit strategy, like I mentioned, winter is another exit strategy. Um, so just be thinking about your exit strategy and it should go pretty well. Um, you can also graze it down to the ground if you have like sheep or goats or whatever and field people not regrow, oats will regrow, but if you do that a couple of times, it will also die. So um, there's definitely more than one way to do things. Um, this is just, sorry, the uh, caption thing. It's like covering the title a little bit, but this is another way to terminate. Um, is anybody into like low till or no till growing? or like interested in tilling less, that's me, right? Mm -hmm. It's another cost because you're paying for fuel, you gotta use ear protection, move heavy equipment around, maybe compact your soil. So if there's another way to do it, I was interested to give it a shot. Um, I ha actually haven't yet. So this is what we're gonna do on one part of the garden with cereal rye. Talk about that in a minute. But this was a cereal rye stand that Cornell Small Farms researchers um, had grown, uh, planted now, grew until winter, cereal rye will then pause once it encounters those freezing temperatures and die back to the roots or just go into hibernation and then regrow come springtime um, and then be like chest high and forming seed head. Um, then they laid this down on the soil with a roller crimper, which I'll show you a, a picture of a not so fancy roller crimper in a bit. Um, and then they apply a silage tarp. I'll show you another photo of that as well, really close down to that rye. Um, and it was in kind of like a mounded three foot wide by like 50 foot raised bed. So they're putting a silage tarp down. It's a black thick tarp, like something you would wrap your boat in for the winter, um, but um, for gardening. And then they were putting bricks in those kind of like walkways to get a really good seal over kind of that mounded raised bed. Um, the energy of the sun will get transferred through that black color. And the cereal rye is trying to regrow after it gets crimped, but it can't because it doesn't have any photosynthetic ability anymore because it's under something black. And eventually it just gets starved out and dies. And you have this really thick mat of awesome biomass to plant through. That's really hard for weeds to grow through. The only caveat is you want to do that about four weeks prior to when you're planting. You definitely cannot apply this tar for like two days and then expect it to be looking like that ready for your tomato crop. So then we got to be thinking, okay, I'm going to plant my tomatoes on May 20th. So then back it, back that up to April 20th, and we better not be roller crimping and applying our, our silage tarp any later than April 20th if we want to get really good results. So cover crops are fun. There's They have a lot of benefit, but you also have to be a little bit more planful. And for uh, busy people, that's not always the easiest, but um, I find it rewarding enough to compensate for that. All right, so this is a picture of what I did last year. So this is kind of like maybe the meat and potatoes of why a couple of you have come. It's like, how do I make a garden bed? Um, what cover crops now to grow in the spring <laughs> next year? So uh, yeah, yeah, you saw that comment? Yeah, that's hilarious, right? So uh, somebody's noting here that ibuprofen is a required uh, resource at the bottom. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, uh, uh, our yard was all sod when we bought it. The previous owners had just no interest in growing anything useful at all, which I was kind of sad about, but it's also fun to have a blank slate, maybe um, customize it to your liking. So um, this is the definitely the quicker, um, but also the harder uh, and the more labor intensive way of um, forming that cover crop uh, stand. Uh, growing a good cover crop and then having that available for spring next year, but it is winter kill friendly. So, um, so bear with me for a second. Square foot by square foot, using a four point spade, you dig out a square foot of sod at a time and you shake out the sod, um, or you just don't do that and throw it all away. But I was like, no, I'm not throwing soil away. That's dumb. So I shook out every square foot of that and like grabbed each one by with my hand and, until like I couldn't feel my like gripping muscles anymore and uh, shook all the soil off. And then, so I ended up with this, you know, big 12 by 12 bare patch of soil. This is our herb garden now. And I, I knew that I like could see it. And that's a really big message uh, that Maggie brought up about like knowing your why. I want to be able to walk out my door and like grab rosemary for pizza or mint for uh, mojito or whatever, whatever your, your herb why is, right? So bare ground. Um, and then cover crop seed. So again, overseeding. This is this ended up being oats, field pea, and tillage radish. Um, and then a uh, good night layer of compost. 
and then watered a lot, like every day until I saw some stuff happen. Um, and here's what you'll need. Four point spade, yard bags. Um, yard bags are for the waste, for the sod removal. Um, I brought it to the Landscape Recycling Center. You can compost the sod probably, um, but again, like there's always another thing to do, you know? And I was just like, no, not today. So you decide, um, inoculant um, for your cover crop seed compost and then man my back hurts so bad after this day so uh break it up and don't do it in one day like you're like come on it's a 12 by 12 space i can do this in one day and i did but i really regretted it afterwards so um i would also add ice packs to the list um if you have some like minor back issues like me so this was seeded august 15th this picture on the left is how it looks two weeks later there's a little patch that like didn't respond as well um, I don't know why, maybe the ground there was too hard. Maybe I didn't like really heavily seed in that corner. Um, but here's a really nice close up of the mix. The tillage radish is only really visible right in the center. Um, everything else that looks like a clover is the field pea and then oats are obviously the grass. Um, I, yeah, so I used three things that are for sure gonna die over winter and I seeded it in August. So I know come spring, you'll be completely ready for planting with no additional labor required. All right, so this is the mix one month into growth. And remember that corner that wasn't doing well? It decided to do well. Um, I don't know if the seed was like raked into the compost and buried, so it just grew more slowly, or if this is the canopy closing asset um, of cover crops that I talked about earlier. Um, but does anybody know what the plants might be trying to communicate? This might be a little bit more visible, like more close up, but you might also be able to see it. Any ideas? Anything you know about the cover crop at all? It's all right if not. We can move on. You guys give up? Yeah. yeah. Uh, anything in the chat, Kayla? <laughs> Anybody know in the chat what's going on with the cover crop? That what are the plants communicating? Oh, nitrogen. Yes, that's it. Who said that? That's awesome. Awesome. Yes, you got it. You win the grand prize. I got to figure out what the grand prize is, but but uh, yeah. So. It's a little bit more visible on my computer. Maybe the color's not quite coming through uh, on the Mondo pad, but it's pretty yellow green. So if you're ever looking at like tomato, cucumber, sweet mm, sweet corn, maybe in the like like primary growth stage, uh, beginning of a cover crop, that's what I'm talking about. That's like one of many different things I've learned to see over the years. So um, sometimes you'll see like purple in the veins of a leaf, and that's phosphorus deficiency. I just know that because of my job, but yeah, so low nitrogen is what's being shown here, but I'm not worried about it because um, it's telling me that there's no nitrogen available or not enough nitrogen available for the plants right now. That's maybe due to two things. Number one, because it's been sod for 20 years. Number two, because I planted it really highly high density and each one of those plants needs like a certain amount of, of all the nutrients to grow to its maximum potential. I'm not worried about it though because I've just thrown down field pea seed that has inoculant on it that's going to fix more nitrogen for that soil for my herb garden. And since I don't have a picture of this, but since we've planted our herbs, we've we've seen none of the yellowing on uh, anything from purple cone flower um, all the way to mint, oregano, uh, thyme, rosemary, um, anise up. Nothing in that garden bed has been anything except nice and green. So. Um, I didn't do a soil test before and after to compare. That would have been really cool to do. I recommend that if you have the time and the energy to do. Um, but yeah, it was an awesome uh, experiment. So this is the second way to do it. I have less uh, uh, adequate photos for, for this section and you get to look at my cat, Garlic, uh, mean, in the meantime. But so that uh, section of garden circled in red is actually the same exact size as the previous uh, different size garden. They're both 12 by 12 approximately. And so in this case, this is the easy, but less quick um, and not winter, uh, and, and it is winter hardy um, monoculture cover crop option. So in this case, we're using cereal rye, which is the only cover crop pretty much, pretty much with some exceptions that you'll ever see in this area of Illinois, McLean County in particular, um, on like corn and soybean fields. If anybody's using a cover crop, it's probably gonna be cereal rye. And it always is like yay tall, like four to six inches tall. I've never seen it get as tall as I did because they're planting it in like October. And so it has like comparatively no time to grow compared to 
late August, right? But so here's what we did. Um, we took the mower and whatever area you want, 100 foot bed, 1,000 square foot bed, whatever, and we set it to the lowest possible setting it'll go, and we took our sweet time mowing it, and we scalped the grass. So <laughs> you're stressing your side. And then we took a four, our handy-dandy trusty steed, our four-point spade, and we stabbed the bejesus out of that area to really stress the side, like just all over. Like you had a bad day, come home and stab the side. It feels good. Like just jump on it. Make sure you're wearing like really good boots for that. Don't do it in sandals or flip-flops. Um, and so really stress the side in all directions. Then um, weeks and months prior to this, we were banking up some thin cardboard. Um, bike shops are a really good source of this. Um, although you might have to remove a couple of staples, um, find a really good source of like thin, free of paint, free of staples, free of tape, cardboard, or just take the tape off your Amazon boxes and flatten them out, whatever it may be, and use them for cover crafting. Um, so in our 12 by 12 area, we laid down, um, oh, yard waste bags will also work, um, but you might have to use two layers. So lay down um, a really thick, heavy duty yard waste bag um, in a pattern that will cover 12 by 12 or whatever your square footage is or cardboard. And then we put about a half an inch layer of compost on top and then wet it down with a hose so that it stays in place and doesn't like slide over the cardboard. And then we broadcast our cover crop seed and it'll, it's like a really weird hand motion, um, but you'll get it. You'll like find one that works for you. you throw your seed in a bucket and then you walk around like Johnny Appleseed and just shake your hand and it comes like falls in a really weird pattern and you're like, oh, that wasn't right. And you figure it out. But seed your cover crap till you have good coverage. And then again, a 99 blanket of additional compost, only like a half an inch, maybe a quarter inch if you're feeling lazy. It'll work as long as you water. And then yes, um, a ton of water. So this over here on the right is a picture of our little high tunnel at the Unity Garden. Um, this is a 360 degree adjustable, reliable sprinkler. I forgot the exact brand name, but it's green with a metal golden head. And there's like three different brands that sell the same thing at Lowe's, Menards, Ace Hard, not Ace Hardware. What's the other one? Home Depot. But I found mine at Lowe's in the gardening center. You can find one on Amazon. Just Google or search tripod irrigator or tripod sprinkler. I think it's like $35 for the one I got. It's kind of pricey, but this will not work unless you have a reliable way to water. And you don't want to be out there with your, you know, hose watering every day you want to just be able to turn something on and go watch tv or like hang out with your kids or whatever it might be how long would you leave it on um until it's wet just you know okay. yeah if it's rained in the last couple of days i would i'm still irrigating every other day just like the field pea and oats combination um again until it gets like four to six inches tall and for this method this does take longer to establish because it's got to grow through cardboard um so it it will like root through cardboard and it'll find the sod and the sod hopefully is halfway dead by the time it finds it. Um, and it'll look like it's not doing a whole lot for a while. It might not grow really quick for a while, but as long as it's not yellowing or dying, you're okay. So I would double the amount of seed that you usually would need for like bare soil in this case, but this does work. I got a really good stand of cereal rye up to my chest in this spot. I, I don't have a picture of how it turned out, but this is our new um, perennial bed. We have strawberries, asparagus. Um, there's some sunflowers, some soybeans in the places that I didn't have perennials for yet. Um, everything is doing awesome. And the only thing that I did is add compost, like at the time of planting this spring, and then compo uh, uh, cover crop it with cereal rye beforehand. Cereal rye will really burrow down into the ground with like thick fibrous roots. And then it grows a ton of biomass for all the benefits that we talked about earlier. So for this method with cardboard, yeah. you would only do cereal rye because it's more effective than if you did oats and field peas. I think it would work with field peas and oats, okay. but I really, but I needed the spot that I tried field pea and oats at my house. I needed that to work because I knew I was going to be planting perennial herbs there yeah. and I only had one shot. So if you're willing to be like, oh no, that didn't work, and then try again in spring, mm -hmm. definitely try the field pea and oats in this manner and report back. And you just yeah. that's kind of giving away the homework. Um, <laughs> so there's homework at the end here, um, if you didn't know. And um, yeah, it's going to be to trial some of the things that we're covering here, and then report back because that's kind of the idea here is to form like not just a we talk at you and then you figure it out thing, but 
eventually there'll be a discussion board on our Moodle page and you could be like, here's what I did. And then somebody else will see it and be like, wow, that's neat. And then you guys are connected, exchange cell phone numbers. Hey, do you mind if I talk to you for 20 minutes about cover crafts or whatever it might be, you know? So that's kind of the idea. Um, sorry, I don't have a picture of how that one turned out. You'll just have to take my word for it. That's a great question though. I've never tried um, field pea and uh, oats on top of cardboard before, but if you do it right now, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Um, you might get slightly less biomass growth because it'll, like I said, take longer to form that stand. And we're like kind of racing against the clock for sun and temperature now. Um, but try it out, see what happens. Um, and then just some more pictures of like what certain termination things look like. And then to wrap up, I'm going to show you actually some pictures of what Maggie did at her demo farm with cover crops. And if she's still on, she can comment about it. Um, I think she said she had to pop off at a certain time. Um, but this is what winter kill cover crops can look like next spring. So um, we did not fall cover crop this side of the garden. This is 2023 on the left side of the screen. We did not fall cover crop it. There was a summer cover crop there, and that was it. And it was sorghum sedan grass, cow pea, and pearl millet. And it grew nine feet tall. Um, it, uh, and then the cow pea got really, really tall because it was trying to compete with the sorghum sedan grass. And I saw like foxes and hawks and bunnies and all sorts of um, small critters and or not so small critters in it. Um, and then so it was all like taller than I could reach. But then after the first freeze, it looked like someone had come through there with like a baseball bat and just kind of like knocked everything down and all the flag leaves were like bent over and they had started to brown. And by like the third hard freeze, everything was like squishy and completely flat. Like nine foot of biomass was just done. And then this was just the only thing that we did here was we mowed the residue on a dry winter day. Like we had like kind of a little bit of a drought last winter into the spring before the rain started. So after like 10 days of dry weather, we mowed it and it was like dust. So pretty cool. Um, and then over here, this was a winter hardy cover crop of red clover that I planted in February of this year. This is our onion patch this year that was just harvested. In this bed, I think we did 400 pounds of onions. So yeah, it was pretty nuts. Um, and uh, I mean, I cheated a little bit and I used the sweet Spanish varieties that get like softball sized. Like, <laughs> so, you know, whatever. But but uh, so this was red clover that grew to like maybe shin height and then we mowed it a bunch. Um, and then in the places that we wanted to put in a bed, we did use our rear time tiller it did require a couple of passes to like get the soil what I call friable enough. That's actually a soil science term, just means like clumpy, but not clumpy to the point where you can plant it with like transplants. Um, so it, it like, I don't know if I would use clover in the same year that you're trying to plant again, because it made the ground kind of hard to break up for planting. It seems to have worked. It just required like me to like put my body weight down on the tiller. So if you're not like, if you don't want to do that, there's simpler ways to do it. So um, tilled twice, like up and down, like multiple times, because it's only 18 inches wide, and then top dressed with compost to hide any existing living roots from the sun. So like the clover roots might be like 90% dead and 10% alive. And that remaining 10%, you can kind of occultate. That's another weird word, which just means deprive of sunlight with a silage tarp or compost. And we didn't have any regrowth of clover in our onions. And onions are like really susceptible to competition. So that was awesome. So and tillage is required. Tillage is required only for winter hardy cover crops. It's not required for field pea and oats. Um, it also wouldn't be required for like cow pea and uh, Japanese millet that you planted in like July 1 and then let go until winter. As long as it dies, by winter temperatures, tillage is not required. Or you could do it um, in the way that, so uh, go back and watch that YouTube video. When you get the recording, go back to that slide or I'll, or just email me and I'll give it to you. It's from Cornell Small Farms and it's how to use that silage tarp um, for termination of cover crops with no tillage. And it's like 50 minutes of like deep dive on no-till termination strategies with a silage tarp. It's kind of niche, but it's really cool. Um, so actually you, you can terminate winter hardy species with a silage tarp as long as you're willing to like lug this big kite around which is what it basically is and unlike a calm day with help you know and then it should be okay 
So I don't know if Maggie's still on, um, but these are her pictures. So this is her demonstration plot in Southern Illinois. This is the- I am here. Sorry. Oh, awesome, thanks for no, <laughs> timing in. So uh, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, this is the Johnny's Selected Seed Fall Green Manure Mix, right? Yes, yeah. Awesome, and uh, you overseeded this, right? Because you didn't know how good the seed was anymore? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it did so, great. <laughs> yeah, so this is a this is a like three foot by what fifty foot long or hundred foot long? I bed? think it's sixty three okay. by three foot by sixty. Okay, awesome. And this is uh so seeded typically in the fall months, so anytime from like late August. Um, I really wouldn't be seeding any cover crops if you can help it. I wouldn't be seeding any cover crops later than like mid September. If you want to get maximum benefit, I'd plant it now, like as soon as possible. Um, winter hardy species or non-winter hardy species. At least the winter hardy ones, if you get a late start, are forgiving in the spring because you're not going to plant until probably May, unless it's like spinach or something like kind of that tolerates crisp temperatures. Um, but at least that will regrow and like add some biomass in the spring that the winter uh, vulnerable ones just can't. Um, so it looks, I think uh, Maggie crimped this area with a T post, which I'll show you a picture of on the next slide here. Um, yes. So have you ever heard of a, who's heard of a roller crimper here before? Like in the commercial ag space, in the organic commercial ag space, especially, um, it's basically a big uh, metal bar that you can drag with a tractor over something like cereal rye. So typically before soybeans, cereal rye would be planted at like a really thick concentration. You get a good stand. And then when you're crimping the stem, you're basically snapping the stem at the root um, at the time of uh, seed set. So if you do it too early and the seed hasn't set yet, that plant will regrow. But if you do it at the time when the plant has put its maximum amount of energy into forming that seed head, it'll just be like, I'm done, I tried. And it'll lay down on the soil. And then if we go to the next slide here, so it's been roller crimped with this super fancy crimping tool over here on the left, which is literally a T-post with rope on it that two people walk along a uh, row with and step on. And then you drag it forward and then you step on it again all the way down 60 feet of row. And so you're just snapping those stems, laying it down over the top of your row. And then um, again, going back to that previous slide, this has all been laid down. It was looking nice. It's been laid down with a T-post. Going back to the next slide, we apply our silage tarp. You can kind of see where the walkways are in the middle there. And then they put bricks there to like ensure that that silage tarp is covering the cover crop residue as tightly as possible. And so your silage tarp doesn't blow away in the next storm because it totally will if you leave it like this. Um, then um, this is what it looks like. So this was a, a winter um, hardy, that is to say, will regrow in the spring mix. Um, some of them died because like the field pea didn't make it, but the um, hairy veg will be winter hardy, the cereal rye and the winter wheat. Um, and so it was all crimped, silage tarp for maybe Maggie can tell us how long, but what we're looking at here is no weeds, high cover crop residue. If you grow your own transplants or you buy transplants, this is planting ready, except I would maybe add like a smattering of fertilizer, like some pelletized poultry litter or something like that, and then maybe compost, but you don't probably need it. There's like a ton of basically, like we said, growing compost in situ, that means right there like with no need to add additional compost. Hey, Maggie, how long was that silage tarp on there? Um, I believe, I think it was on a month. I think because okay. I got out there kind of early and it wasn't very long. I was actually really surprised at how quickly it killed it. Awesome. So this is, uh, I think this is our last, one of our last pictures and our last slides. But yeah, the power of like low labor, um, power of simple tools, nothing fancy. Um, ready for planting. I so, do have a comment about it. Oh, go Sorry. ahead. Go ahead. Oh, and then we have a question about it. Go ahead, Maggie. Okay. I was just going to say um, this is actually kind of a special spot because it was just hard clay. And you can look in the center of those walkways. I've had people come, what are you growing rice in there? Because it holds water. It's just a working progress. But the first year we planted in it, everything was not great. It was all, everything grew really small because it was so compacted. The roots didn't do anything. And this year, after putting the cover crops and everything, I wish I would have got a picture, but things have grown super great. I mean, everything's, except for some disease. We've had some pretty bad disease pressure down here. But um, it, it's just 
a working progress and we're just kind of letting nature take its course with it a little bit to bring in beneficials and just letting it take its time to establish more naturally, right. I guess. <laughs> And then you had a comment about this? Oh, I just wanted to ask. So if yeah. she hadn't done the silage tarp method, mm -hmm. the other version would be terminating with like cutting and then. Yeah. So depending on the stand of cereal rye or winter wheat or whatever, it has been, it, it can be done where roller crimping at a high density of planting will be the only thing that you need to do. If you're planting direct, if you're planting transplants in there, Yes, that should work. Transplants um, are like seeds that you have started and yeah. then are going to be planting. Yeah, okay. like like at a farmer's market in the spring, a bunch of people at the Bloomington and Normal Market, uh, maybe at the market closest to you will sell you like a tomato plant. That's a transplant. Okay. Um, as opposed to a direct seeded crop, like if you were to use a single row seeder for like uh, cucumbers or soybeans or so yeah, in the organic commercial ag space, it has been done where they roller crimp the field and then they direct seed soybeans into that heavy duty biomass and it can work. However, if your stand sucks, then your weed pressure is terrible and it does not end up well. Or if you, t if you terminate or crimp at like kind of the wrong, like kind of the wrong time, like just a little bit, it also won't work. So um, in that case, um, just cause like, I'm just assuming people's skill levels with, with relation to cover crops is, like beginner level and just assuming that you want it to work the first time or maybe the second time, I would uh, advocate for tillage in that case. So yeah, maybe like tarp it if you can, if it's too big to tarp and you have a tiller, I would definitely like lay it down with something and then till it. The problem is though, um, that high biomass is like probably gonna gum up your tiller and you might need to like pause every 20 feet, turn it off, get under it, tip it upside down and reach in there with your hands and pull it out, which I've done and it takes forever. So I would go the, the silage tarp method, um, which it sounds like between um, the video I showed you and Maggie that we have some direct experience in the room that says that will work for those winter hardy species. So it's one more thing to buy, but at least you won't, you know, have any problems that way. So I do have a comment on silage tarps um, oh. because they are expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got mine. I, my dad is a farmer. Um, and I asked him, I said, do you have one? He said, yeah, when he brought it, it was spray, spray painted red on one side. And I'm like, why did you do that? <laughs> it's like peeling off. And he's like, I didn't, I got it from consolidate grain and barge. It's the tarps they use to cover the corn. And this is the cut up pieces that they throw out. Yeah. So it. it was actually, I don't know if he was able to get it because he's a farmer and takes things there, but you can look, I know there's people that do the tarps that are on billboards. Some people around here have used them. This guy sells them. It's like huge pieces of it. And he sells it and um, for like 40 bucks a piece or something. That's in Missouri. I just heard someone talking about that the other day. I wish I had more information. But yeah, you might try some places like that. I don't know um, how to get an in on that, but that's just where he told me he got it. Yeah, so. there's, a, there's a Facebook page called Central Illinois Homesteading, which I cool. think I shared this opportunity for this class with. Um, I think it's called Central Illinois Homesteading and then in parentheses, buy, sell, trade. And it's like 90% livestock posts of like, hey, I have these rabbits or goats or whatever for sale. Um, or, hey, we have this or that going on. But um, I've gotten a really good reception posting classes there. People do ask in that group all the time. There's another group, which is, I think, only available to join if you're a member. But um, Central Illinois Young Farmers Coalition um, is the Central Illinois chapter of the Young Farmers Coalition of the United States. Um, I do believe you have to be like a for-profit farmer to be part of that page. I may be wrong, but you could try posting on there, hey, does anybody have any silage tarp for sale? Because small farms use them. So, um, but yeah, to your point, Maggie, about locating things locally, um, post on your Facebook page or ask your friends and family, um, or yeah, go to your like nearest marina and be like, hey, do you have any extra boat plastic? I don't know if that's the same thing or not. I think it is though, especially at least the black ones. Um, but um, we got 15 minutes left and I wanna make time for questions. So um, thanks for your clarifying comments, Maggie. Um, <clears throat> so uh, last list of the day here. Um, these are just some options for um, legumes and grasses within the warm season and cool season cover crops worlds. Um, so an L indicates a legume for nitrogen, um, a G indicates grass, and then they're divided up into when you can use them. This is fall and spring. This is uh, summer. 
It looks like people like this slide. I like that. Cool. I like when I make a slide that's valuable. Um, What's the B then? The B. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> what, the heck, what the heck was that B for? I get something for yourself. <laughs> what was that B? Yeah, yeah, yeah. B is for both. Yeah, you're right. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You can use that in summer. No problem. Um, people just typically use it for for uh, for fall. Um, but yeah, the asterisk uh, does indicate um, uh, winter hardiness. So you will need to make an exit strategy plan for those. Um, so a lot of people use cereal rye. I've used winter wheat in its place. Um, hairy vetch is another one. Um, they all need to be properly planned for in the spring. Um, and we will, like I said, we're recording this and we'll be getting this out to you as soon as our Moodle page is set up. So, and we can send this to you as well. Um, so, all right. So these are my final tips for like everything that I've covered. Just overseed. If you're going to use cover crops, just overseed. Just do it. Um, uh, go through a, uh, there's a, a really cool uh, resource that I think I skipped over. It's called the Midwest Cover Crops Council. Um, they have a decision-making tool on their website, which is super user-friendly. You pop in your calf crops, so it'll feel weird because it'll make you feel like a farmer if you're not a farmer, but it's fine. Um, and you can plug in like tomatoes or melons or whatever, whatever it may be, just like pick something that is like the time of year where that bed will be occupied with stuff. Um, and then you can um, see in kind of a slide bar calendar year orientation view of like the gaps where you won't have anything growing in that bed during the year. And then it'll match you up with cover crop species that work for that time of year. Um, so anyway, 1.5 times the recommended rate per species. So if it says three pounds per thousand square feet in a monoculture, that means I read that as 4.5 pounds um, in a mix. So I'll do, so if something is like, so field pea and oats, um, I have three pounds of seed in there that'll more than do a 10 by 10 uh, area. And um, it'll be more than you need, but you'll have that dense sand quicker. Um, use cover crop mixes. I've said enough about it. I would just, I would just do a two-way mix to start. Um, water a lot for the first two to four weeks. Be willing to make mistakes and learn. So um, I wouldn't have known anything that I had done to this point would have worked if I hadn't just be like, I don't know, we'll try it and be okay with falling on my face and you know, like, okay, we're not doing that again. Like clover the year that I'm going to plant there. I wouldn't do that again. Wait, wait another year on the clover. Um, and then last but not least, we have our homework. So buy a cover crop species if you're if you're gonna do this. Um, I would really like to know what happens to your cover crop, Sam, because you've spent time and valuable uh, effort being here and learning about this topic. If you implement it, um, I really appreciate it. If you at least shared with me, but better yet, sharing with somebody that ends up coming to some of these classes or a friend or a family member, you can become your neighborhood's cover crop evangelist like me. <laughs> um, it's really fun. And people have no idea what you're talking about. And they're like, oh, what is this guy? <laughs> but then I show them like the, the stands in the winter that look nice or the birds on the sunflowers. And they're like, okay, that looks cool. So you win them over with uh, education. Um, I will share anonymously with the class your results if you want, or you don't have to be anonymous. Um, eventually, like I mentioned, we'll be setting up a way for you all to share on like a kind of like a classroom Moodle type format um, if you should so choose. And yeah, it'll be awesome. So um, good luck, have fun, try something new. And um, PSA, I messed up. I did not buy inoculants for the cover crop seed for the legume. So you can either take the cereal rye seed and you, that allows you to like either plant later or plant now and get a really nice stand and then plan for silage tarp or tillage. Or um, you could buy the... Um, Austrian winter pea or oats, um, and then just go on stock seed farms or Johnny selected seed and buy the pea vetch lentil um, inoculant or whatever it might be called. And as long as it says pea on it, it'll work. So, and it'll be like, I think the stock seed farm one was like 15 bucks, something like that. So, send pictures of progress. Um, Final thing, um, we are state, federally, and locally funded, um, and we do not get our funding unless we um, can show that we are programming um, to the people that look like the results of our census data. Um, that's called parity, if anybody is familiar with like government work. Um, so you should be able to scan this QR code with your smartphone. Um, anybody listening online, 
Um, please scan this with your smartphone if you can. I do also have demographic paper copy surveys if somebody in here is having technical issues or, or uh, problems with their phone. Is it working? Has anybody been able to pull it up yet? Mm -hmm. Awesome, cool. So um, it's completely anonymous. This will also allow me and Maggie and anybody else um, from Extension working on these series of uh, projects and uh, workshops to put on better classes. Um, we do read the comments. Um, so we really appreciate your time and filling it out. It should take like two to three minutes tops. So I'm gonna like stop talking for a minute so you can think, and then we will return for as many minutes of questions as you wanna ask me. It looks like we have about 10 minutes left of our class time. So really appreciate your patience and uh, sticking around for the full time. I'm gonna check out the chat to see what's going on and share anything um, that might be relevant if need be. And then uh, we unfortunately can't take digital payment for uh, the cover crop seed, but we can do cash or check. And if you don't have that with you today, um, I'm here Monday through Friday, usually um, sometimes out in the field, but you can always come back and um, we can get you squared away in the week to come or whatever it might be. What is the cover crop seed you have here? Yeah, so um, I've got two options. Um, one is a mix, uh, 1.5 pounds of Austrian winter pea, which is a legume, and 1.5 pounds of oats. And then the other one is just the monoculture of cereal rye. And, and you cere didn't put inoculant in, correct? I did not. I definitely should have. I, I remembered everything. I remembered like getting my slides squared away, my evaluation in the presentation, getting everything to Maggie and getting everything set up, but I forgot that one thing. So um, yeah, I'm sorry about that. But remember, you can grow the field pea oats uh, or pea oat mix. Um, and there are some amount of, it's called rhizobia, is the bacteria species in your soil just natively. It's just a question of like, how long are you willing to wait to cultivate that population when instead you could just apply it and get like a big one right away? So good question now. All right, let me check the chat here. I did have a comment really fast about broadcasting, if you don't mind. <laughs> Yeah, please. I was just going to say, uh, so when we got our acreage, um, it was in corn and soybean, and I that's I didn't want that, so I don't have that equipment. And I was like, so we have a Kubota that we got and a five-foot tiller, and we tilled all of it. We were just with a tiller, 14 acres with a small five-foot tiller. I think my husband thinks I'm crazy. He did not grow up doing that. And then we bought 14 acres worth of seed, and we threw it on this 10 acres, and we did it by with a small lawn grass cedar hooked to the back of a four-wheeler and it took forever and I was like this is all gonna not work like I'm just freaking out in my brain and we luckily got a really great rain and that was what helped it but it came up beautifully but we did overseed and we had I had looked ahead and saw that we were just gonna get rain 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 I almost thought it was gonna be too much rain mm. um and wash it away but it ended up coming up and so you'll hear a lot like I people Farmers have, that do cover crops, I've seen cover crops growing out here at my office, and they see me throw crimp it or throw a thing on it, and they'll be like, that's never going to kill that. And it does. So don't be afraid to try stuff. If mm -hmm. people will tell you it's not going to work, just try it. Maybe don't try it on like 10 acres, but try it in yeah. a small spot and see. So, yeah, I tell people never to experiment with 100% of anything, like especially trying a new crop like a new variety of whatever, especially if you're commercial and your like bottom line depends on the performance of what you're using. That's not a good thing to play with. You play with like 10% of your total area. Um, cover crops a little more forgiving. Maybe you play with like a quarter of your area. Yeah. Um, awesome. If you guys have finished your uh, evaluation and your brain is too fried to ask me questions, you're definitely um, more than able to pick up on Zoom or in person um but yeah i'd love to hear any questions that you guys wrote down and um we can go back to your slides if anybody needs to see an individual slide um if you don't want to wait for them to be shared uh yeah Paul. so you talked about your perennial bed you you only had one shot at getting the cover crop done right yeah so you did is or, there anything to prevent you from doing a fall cover crop that's not winter hardy and a perennial bed that dies off in the next spring your perennials are still going along i've hard. definitely thought about doing that and i think I think I will. Okay. Um, some of the some of the herbs that I planted absolutely exploded, um, and not all of them are um, perennial. Probably like two thirds of them are perennial. So there will be like once I and, and all those that are annual, I'll probably cut down to the base, 
take into my uh, basement and hang upside down and dehydrate. And then I'll have these big kind of like circular shaped patches in my herb garden that already happened. Uh, like two thirds of the herb garden, herb garden got planted out this year. And a third of it, we just didn't have plants yet because money, you know, you run out of money in spring, like really easy with all these hobbies. So, um, so I ended up planting um, peas, like um, Oregon giant snap peas and sugar snap peas on a trellis that took up like a third of the bed. And those all came out last month. And I put down cowpea and oats. And we have a nice, like, almost knee-high cowpea and oats stand there. So um, I've never tried to broadcast uh, a non-winter hardy, um, that is to say winter vulnerable um, cover crop into, like, a perennial crop. But something like strawberries or something that whose biomass is, like, really low to the ground I don't know if that would work well because then you're going to shade out the strawberries and you might kill it before winter. Actually, I've heard of people doing that specifically like with strawberries because that's what lays down mm. protects the strawberries over the okay. winter. Okay. So yeah. Hmm. Okay. I I will I will try it and maybe back off on my seeding just a little bit. Sure. Yeah, and then I can share what happens too. Yeah, I then I can have some skin in the experimentation <laughs> thing as well. That's a good thought. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'll check the chat here to see if we've got anything. Um, so uh, somebody said True Leaf Market online does sell um, a garden cover crop mix that is pre-inoculated. I've never heard of this business, but that's cool. Um, I think I think John may have a pre-inoculated one as well as selling like inoculant powder to make your own mix. Um, somebody said uh, I've got some summer squash, spaghetti squash, and pumpkins growing. If I broadcast fall cover crop seed around those plants, um, I, I kind of worded this question weird, but um, Michael, if you're if you're on, maybe uh, unmute yourself if if you can, or I can uh, unmute and um, maybe. Yeah, I, I think I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead with your question. Okay, so I've got summer squash. Um, uh, spaghetti squash and lots and lots of pumpkins growing mm -hmm. um, over about a third of my uh, plot. Yeah. And would you broadcast the summer sea or the, uh, cause I'm, I'm doing the, the winter kill fall cover crop, the, the field peas and the oats. Would you broadcast that around the squash that's still in the process of growing and, and, you know, uh, it's fruiting right now, so the fruit's going to be ripening. Would you do that? Would it cause problems for those squashes? Um, if they're pretty close to fully mature, uh, maybe like a month out, maybe six weeks out tops from being fully mature, I see no problem with that. Um, you are going to see a little bit of a lag, you know, with a cover crop um, establishment. Mm -hmm. Like the picture I showed of like the four week old cover crop was only a couple inches tall. It really. Right from month like two from month like four uh, month one through month two um so that should work because i would think most winter squash thanks. see you later thanks for coming um and grab a flyer for next time if you're interested or able um but uh yeah no i don't think there's any issue with that uh option because uh all your um winter squash should be pretty much done in the next like month or so i would think Okay, I'm 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 new to growing pumpkins and yeah. and that, so I'm not sure how to judge when they're you know if they're a month out. According to the seed packet, they should be done mid to end October. Yeah, I wouldn't go by the days to maturity on a seed packet because that's all based on best practices planting dates. Uh huh. You got them in late, or if you're in northern Illinois where the season gets short sooner than down here. Um, you would go by color, like, so check out the picture of uh, the pumpkin or winter squash or whatever it might be. And um, if it gets to the the color of maturity that's shown on the seed catalog or whatnot, I know it's a weird way to think about it, but that's a pretty good indicator, especially for a pumpkin or spaghetti. Okay. Squash. And, and if you have a bunch, take a sacrificial pumpkin if you're like, or a sacrificial spaghetti squash, if you're using it now, or like a squash in particular, you could, you could use that now and just cut it open and try and make spaghetti noodles out of it. And if it works, then they're done. You know what I mean? Right, so, right. Yeah, give it a shot. Good question. Okay. Um, right, also, like you. when you planted them, I'm not sure if it's the same for where you're at and like down here in Southern Illinois, but like if you planted them, direct seeded them June 1st or you planted out transplants July, first week of July, 
that's yep. usually what farmers around here aim for for a maturity of end of September into October when people want pumpkins. So yep. if you planted some of those varieties around those times, mm -hmm. that it, you might get some more that are maturing a little quicker. Yeah, I plant. Hang on a second, I'm flipping because I, I, I keep <laughs> notes of everything. I planted my pumpkins on the fifteenth of June. I okay. planted my squashes about um, a week later. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's a good time, and you're probably yeah. right. Probably since September, at beginning of October. Yeah. Okay. Been... So, so you say that I could go ahead and spread the cover crop among them now, or should I wait a couple of weeks? No, I, if you're if you're going for the winter kill, uh, mm -hmm. I definitely go now. Um, okay. Yeah, you're gonna start to run into sunlight reduction pretty soon. It's already okay. it's already drastically shorter than just a couple of weeks ago. So. Yeah. yeah now. Um. Anybody else have parting questions? It's seven thirty, so please feel free to leave at any time. I'll stick around for a couple minutes past time if you've got any final thoughts. Are any of the cover crops actually harvested? Are any cover crops harvestable? That's a great thought. Um, I've eaten um, like tea tops before, like board tea tops when they're flowering. Um, just the tops that are like pretty tender in like salads before. Um, they're not going to be toxic, so try it out and see if you like it. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, that's turn up great grains. Uh, yeah, right. The grains are like the right. good candidate, like rye, um, uh, oats. And then uh, wheat too. Oh, you were talking but, about the milking. Millet. Yeah, you could keep the oats. Uh, millet too. You could keep the oats until like the milky stage. And some people um, use that for tea or like, yeah, um, medicinal products that I'm not allowed to teach about, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but uh, we do have an herbal, we do have a crafting herbal gifts from the homestead class in Atlanta, Illinois on October 12th. Um, at the Atlanta Public Museum with uh, Wertheim's Gardens. So stay tuned for that one. You'll get a link about that one shortly if you're on the mailing list. Um, but yeah, um, you can keep those ones around like the rye and other grains. But then um, if you touch them and they're like the non, if they're the shattering variety of grains and you cut those out of the field, they'll spread seed everywhere. But again, like, you know, use a, a scuffle hoe and like kill them in spring before they get hit and it'll be okay. So if anybody wants to cover crop seed, I'll distribute that now. Um, everybody on Zoom, thanks for joining. Um, we really appreciate your time. I'm going to end the presentation so I can figure things out in the office. And uh, stick around for uh, uh, additional notices about future classes and emails. Thanks a bunch, all.